In the last 4 videos, we have fixed 486 CPUs starting from an Intel DX266 up to one of the fastest CPUs you can get for the Socket 3 platform, an AMD 5x86 133ADZ. Sadly, the AMD CPU, overclocked to 160MHz, struggled in certain areas of the game to deliver an acceptable frame rate in software mode. Today, we are going to pave the way for 3D Accelerated Tomb Raider by restoring this poor diamond monster 3D. If you have followed my channel for some time, you may have seen some of my other 3D effects videos. The performance gains that can be achieved by one of those 3D add-on cards are close to a miracle. And I do not expect anything else but voodoo magic for our 486 CPUs. If we manage to fix this original Voodoo 3D Accelerator, then all benchmarks in the next video will be recorded with this card. This Diamond Monster 3D suffers from multiple issues. The worst one are the badly deformed legs on the frame buffer chip. Some of the pins are twisted and bent in multiple directions. Those will be quite difficult to fix due to the possibility of easily breaking them off. If I can, I want to avoid reattaching multiple replacement legs to the 3DFX chip. That is also the reason I decided against removing any of the 3DFX chips with hot air. The reason is simple. If I can avoid exposing old hardware to excessive heat, I will always pursue the less stressful method of restoration. I guess someone tried to fix this card before, because we can see solder bridges in many places around both 3DFX chips. The person attempting this repair most likely did not use an appropriate tool for this work. Additionally, there are multiple instances of legs being displaced above the designated pads. That can happen when the soldering iron used here was either too large, or the person was simply not careful, which resulted in bent pins that eventually ended up being soldered together. I think the repair attempt was interrupted and eventually stopped due to the many issues we have seen so far, and the fact that there are still many loose pins remaining. The texture mapping unit has quite a few legs that aren't connected to the card anymore. And then there is also this one pin that is completely missing. We need to solder a replacement pin to this position. Luckily, the missing pin is on one of the corners of the 3DFX chip, so it won't be too difficult to fix this. But before we start with the repair, I would like to tell you about today's video sponsor, PCBWay. Discover new ways to turn your projects into reality with the help of PCBWay, your go-to destination for top-tier PCB manufacturing and assembly services. Their cutting-edge facilities and skilled professionals ensure precision and efficiency delivering high-quality printed circuit boards tailored to your unique specifications. Once the Tomb Raider series concludes, we are going to experiment with newly created 30-pin SIM PCBs and see what we can do using an adapter to make them compatible with 72-pin memory sockets. PCBWay's other services include sheet metal fabrication, CNC machining, as well as 3D printing services. You should definitely check out PCBWay.com if you are in need of any of those services. Links are in the video description. But now let's go back to our Diamond Monster 3D. The first thing I will do is to remove as much of the old solder as possible. That will immediately resolve one of the issues we have. We are getting rid of most of the solder bridges. I noticed that my solder wig works much better in combination with Flux. If you are interested in any of the tools I am using, then please check the video description. There you will find links to most of the products I am using in this video. While we are here, let's also quickly fix those two bent pins. You have seen me do this multiple times already, but since I got those fine tweezers, this task became a lot easier. Five sides of the 3DFX chips did not have major issues, except for a few loose pins. After fixing any bent pins, I just reapplied solder and then I went ahead to clean up the flux and solder residue. Of course, once done, we should verify that all pins have been soldered properly. Once more, the thin tweezers prove to be of invaluable help. I just go between the gaps of the pins and try to notch them a little bit. You should easily spot a pin that isn't soldered properly. In my case, none of the pins were loose, so we can move on to the next task. Fixing the missing pin. I think there must have been some sort of impact that ripped off the outermost pin, but also bent the one next to it. This pin is extremely weak, and it will make another appearance closer to the end of this video. Unfortunately, when the corner pin broke off, it did not leave any stub or metal remains to attach a new leg. Therefore, I need to remove some of the chip housing. For this work, I usually use an engraving pen. There are bits in different shapes and sizes for it, but this is the one that works best for me. I even use it to remove solder mask above traces, or remove leftovers of broken off CPU pins. It is a very universal tool. You have seen me fix those pins multiple times before. 
I use a 0.2mm copper wire and create replacement legs in a similar S shape as the original pins, and then it is just a matter of soldering them to the chip. I have done this so many times that this is no longer as difficult as it once was. Now let's move on to the worst side of the frame buffer chip. Those pins are in really bad shape. Some are twisted and others are badly bent and have lost their original shape. I debated if I should remove the entire chip and try to work on the pins with the chip separated from the card. However, after looking over the damage, I decided against it. I most probably would have broken off a few pins trying to get them back in shape. That also means that this side won't look perfect after we are done. But I prefer a working card that doesn't look perfect over a card that has even more replacement pins soldered on. Each pin I work on feels different and the badly deformed pins are a lot weaker compared to the undamaged pins. One wrong move and those tiny metal legs will break off. I won't even try to get some of them back in shape. Others just have their base tilted or twisted. The tweezers do an amazing job once more and help to get those defects rectified. And after a few moments, this side is also ready to be resoldered. Of course, here we need to be a lot more careful. Once I was done with both 3DFX chips, I cleaned the areas I worked on properly with isopropyl alcohol and expected the card once more. The 3DFX chips look really good. All pins have a shiny new solder connection to the card and most imperfections have been removed. Except for that one side on the frame buffer chip. But as I said before, I prefer this to soldering replacement pins to all the places where I probably would have accidentally broken off the legs. And then I looked over the memory chips. And I'm happy I did. As you can see here, this chip lost its connection to the board. There must have been a hard impact on the corner of this chip. I went over all the pins of this memory chip with fresh solder. I don't think this damage justifies a complete removal of the chip. I also checked the other side of the card for missing or broken SMD components. But I couldn't find anything suspicious. We are ready to test this Diamond Monster 3D in our Socket 3 system. I'm always a bit nervous about using never before tested hardware. As a sanity check, I tested the PCI connector for possible shorts on the power delivery, but there was nothing wrong. So, let's see if this card works. The system is powering on with the Tseng ET6000 providing the image on the screen. So far, everything looks good. On the system summary screen, we also see a new entry in the table listing a multimedia device. This should be our 3DFX Voodoo card. A quick test under DOS is to launch the Mojo application, a debugging tool for 3DFX Voodoo 1 and Voodoo 2 cards. And Mojo indeed reports to have found a Voodoo board. We have a frame buffer connected to 2MB as well as one TMU chip which is connected to the other 2MB of video memory. Great, it looks like this Voodoo card works. But we will only know for sure if we start Tomb Raider in 3DFX mode. At launch, Tomb Raider was only available in software mode and many 3D accelerator manufacturers created a patch for Tomb Raider to use their API and hardware capabilities. ATI, S3 and 3DFX are a few of those patches that are available for this game. We of course use the 3DFX glide patch. And the game seems to start. But the 3DFX animation is quite slow. I have a bad feeling about this. And once we are in the menu of Tomb Raider, we can see that we have some graphical issues. The picture is not clear and has dots spread across the entire screen. Luckily, I had something very similar on another Voodoo card, a Maxi Gamer 3D, where three pins were missing, coincidentally, in the same corner as on this Diamond Monster 3D. The pattern of the texture corruption is so similar that I immediately inspected the corner of the card once more. And now that one pin makes its reappearance. It was so weak that it must have disconnected while I was cleaning the card. I ended up replacing this pin as well. Now two pins have been replaced with copper wires in this corner. The follow-up test of this card looks a lot better now. The texture corruption is gone. I am really sorry that I am not showing any moving footage of Tomb Raider in this video, because I do not want to spoil the content of the next video. All I can tell you for now is that the game started in 3DFX glide mode, the Diamond Monster 3D seems to be working without issues, and we are running Tomb Raider at a resolution of 640 by 480 on socket 3. In the next video we are going to test all the repaired 486 CPUs, the DX266 with writeback cache, 
The Cyrex 5X86 at 100 and hopefully at 120MHz with all extra features enabled. And finally the AMD 5X86 133ADZ at 133 and 160MHz. I will also attempt to run this CPU at 200MHz using a higher voltage. But I cannot promise that it will work. The AMD CPU does not boot at 200MHz and the stock voltage of 3.45V. The only other option I have is to move up to 4V. If the CPU boots at this voltage and 200MHz, then this will be part of the benchmarks next week. And with this we have reached the end of today's video. I hope you are happy that we were able to recover another 3DFX Voodoo card. And if you enjoyed today's content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And finally, I want to thank all my Patreons for their invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.